hi, everybody. I know that there are some new names here and also some folks who we've come across in the past. Um, my name is Caitlin Zaney. I'm the Executive Director of Invest in Open Infrastructure. Um, we're also joined by Richard Dunks, who's our Director of Research and Strategy. Um, you'll be hearing from him in a bit. Um, as Ann had said, and thank you, Ann, for kicking us off, we are super excited to have you all here. Uh, it's been an exciting start to the year as we've um, released the first look at the Catalog of Open Infrastructure Services. And even more importantly, um, are sharing that with you all um, for that. So just some ground rules and expectations as we go into the next um, part of the hour. Um, and also to outline how we wanna work together. Now, this call as was this morning as well, the other session that we had is designed as a place for learning and conversation. Um, we seek at IOI to work in the open. Um, and part of that is to have a, a really safe place for dialogue and for learning together. So just a few ground rules to go over here. Um, you know, seek to understand, not be understood. We're here to learn with you in, in the most authentic way. Uh, we reminder reminder to folks to be curious. Uh, we want to know what this project has stimulated. What questions does it bring up? Um, we also, as Anne had said, have a place in the agenda for not only questions, but also suggestions, ways we can help make this better. Be helpful. We want to focus on solutions to the problems identified. And as always, be respectful. Um, we want to build community, not tear it down. Um, I will also add to the chat, you know, this is under the IOI Code of Conduct, um, which applies to all of our um, virtual and hopefully eventually one day ever um, in-person <laughs> events. So we have not in the history of IOI had one of those just yet. <laughs> but um, actually, Anne or Richard, if you want to um, get that Code of Conduct off of our homepage and drop it in the chat, that would be great. Next slide, please. As a bit of a um, high level, we wanted to spend some time giving you um, some insight into how this project came to be. Um, as many of you, some of you have been around since um, I joined IOI in March of 2020, um, Anne and Richard have joined more recently in the last few months. Um, for the past six months, we've been building off of some initial research that we had done at IOI um, and also with some funding we have from the Mellon Foundation and Arcadia, starting to investigate um, how we can, you know, further explore resources to help decision makers and help, you know, move the sustainability and adoption of open infrastructure forward. Um, Richard, feel free. I know we've got a couple of bullet points on the slide too. Um, one of the core elements for the Catalog of Open Infrastructure Services or what we're referring to as COIS, um, one of the key aims in this uh, prototype is to help address some information asymmetries. What we mean by that are, you know, we heard from in our Future Open Scholarship work from 2020 and 2021, uh, from pra practitioners, from funders, from institutional budget owners, those that are um, in consortia and otherwise, that there's a lot of um, duplication in work and also a lot of questions in terms of how decisions are being made, how technology choices are being um, assessed, what information is guiding those decisions. And we wanted to help provide a resource to you know, um, surface that information in a more visible and accessible way. You can keep hitting through. Richard. <laughs> um, we also wanted to help foster a greater understanding of these services. Um, and you'll see as we kind of walk through um, this here, how we're approaching that and in our, um, our initial first cut of this. Um, cultivating a deeper awareness of how the services are provided and some additional dimensions um, for that. Um, we'll be talking through this presentation as well about um, where we've pulled from some sources of inspiration because we know that there's been an increased focus, um, especially over the past few years in you know, understanding a bit more uh, at a granular level about how these services are not only provided, but also how they may align with some of the values and principles that we want to have in the space. And of course, have a prototype to show what we are looking at. When we talk about standardizing key pieces of information, like you would find in say, um, making another sort of investment decision for say a stock or a bigger purchase, can we start to standardize some forms of information that we wanna make available? 
um, in that capacity. And then last bullet point there. The other component here is that um, we wanted to help meet the needs of various stakeholders. Um, our core groups that we identify here are funders. Um, you know, in many cases, those are philanthropic funders, government funders, but also thinking more broadly for those that might be um, aiming to invest in this work. Um, and that includes institutional leads, consortial leads, and perhaps future um, industry stakeholders. Um, infrastructure providers and also users. And we know that there is some overlap in some cases if you're looking at those like within institutions, for example, for the state. Next slide. Um, in terms of what we drew inspiration from, um, over the past six months, uh, we set out originally, and, and COIS is sort of a, a manifestation of the research we've done. Um, our research team, Richard and also our colleague Asura and Gabar, um, set out to you know, pull together some of the existing research in the space, some of the existing resources um, there. So Richard, feel free to um, include some of that. Um, uh, one of the founding sort of resources in this is uh, the mapping the scholarly communication landscape census and also bibliographic scan. Um, the scholarly communication technology catalog, also known as SCOMCAT, uh, which is a repository and a catalog in and of itself of scholarly communication technologies. Um, the list of open access publishing tools from the Radical Open Access Collective, uh, as well as the values and principles framework and assessment work um, that Educopia has been leading in collaboration with a number of other key stakeholders, including the California Digital Library, Longleaf Publishing, Lyricist, and others um, for the Next Generation Library Publishing Project. And uh, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, as well as the um, large list of <laughs> 400 plus is, uh, it feels like under underselling it. Um, the uh, list of tools and innovations in scholarly communication that's been compiled by Jerome Bozeman and Bianca Kramer of Utrecht University Library. Now we mentioned these sort of resources here as well, um, not only to kind of pay our sort of thanks and our gratitude towards um, this work, but also just to note that, you know, the we focused on the 10 initial projects for COIS um, to be able to help test out a number of our assumptions in this work and also in collaboration with IOI's steering committee and also other stakeholders um, to not only look at different um, subsections of the infrastructure landscape, places where we might have questions um, and wanted to further engage the stakeholders and the project leads. Um, and so the, the work here, we, we hope in the future to be able to kind of build off of and continue to iterate on. But our thanks to those who've um, done this work. Now, I'm happy to pass it off to Richard um, to talk a little bit more about how we went about this work and some of the data sources that went into it. Richard, over to you. Thanks, Kay. I really appreciate it. So as Kay mentioned, I'm the director of uh, research and strategy, uh, newly minted uh, as of last week. So uh, excited to be in this position. Um, I did serve for the first six months, of, or last six months of last year as research data analyst, so intimately involved in putting these pieces together. Um, and how we did that, we basically went out and collected data from various different sources, um, primarily starting with the provider and uh, providers themselves, their websites, uh, as well as the funders um, and the uh, information that they make public. Um, there is, a, as you may imagine, um, a lot of uh, inconsistencies into what's provided on those websites as a primary information sources. Some providers uh, provide a lot of detail on their funding sources, some don't, have provide much less detail. Um, some funders uh, provide lots of detail and others provide almost nothing. So um, what we, we had to make some decisions early on, even just in this initial part about how we were going to handle this. And you'll find, um, if you haven't had a chance to look through uh, COIS yet, which we'll, we'll do a demo here in a moment, um, we try to make clear what we're including is what we call verifiable funding, which means um, just having a blog post or a little blurb saying, oh, we got funding from X foundation is insufficient to be included in this. Um, we we're really looking for things that we can verify. So um, for those you know funders who do publish this information, thank you. <laughs> uh, we, we did integrate that and, and, and made use of that in this. Uh, it's in keeping with our mission as an evidence-based organization. We want to make sure that we're including something we can really check on. Um, but also we would encourage all entities in this space to really think about their transparency and, and disclosures around this information because it is really important information. So 
Starting with providers and the funder websites, we also drew from annual reports for those organizations that, that, that um, uh, made those available. Uh, they were useful information about financials and governance and some other kind of aspects of the organization over that course of that year. So it was another valuable source of information for us, particularly uh, for those organizations that don't have financial disclosure requirements. Um, for those, those that do, however, the US Internal Revenue Service um, uh, requires any uh, organization chartered in the United States under the 501c3 or 501c6 of the tax code to form what's called a Form 990, which is a financial disclosure, um, but also uh, details things about governance and other aspects of the organization. So this cohort of, of 10 organizations that we have, six of them are chartered in, or based in the United States and are subject to this requirement. Uh, so this is a great uh, source of data for us, um, but also has its own challenges with it. If for those of you who haven't had the, the privilege of looking through uh, XML data that changes from year to year, it is not easy <laughs> to, to work with. There's a, a larger effort in the nonprofit assessment, academic nonprofit assessment space to harmonize this data and make it more useful. Um, and, and we're in touch with them and, and are working kind of uh, learning from them about how we might be able to better do this. So, but it's a great source of information for this when we talk about funding models and, and some of the governance structures uh, in place in these organizations and some of the personalities involved as well. Uh, we also engage directly with the providers, the service providers. Um, and uh, we set up interviews with the project leads. Um, and prior to those interviews, we did a pre-interview survey that polled them for um, particular pieces of information that were, was useful. You'll note that in the application, when we go through it, you'll see in the catalog, you'll see self, um, the self-reported ranking measures. Those are from the pre-interview survey that we had. Um, we did take this information and provide it back to the um, service providers for their input to correct any omissions or errors that we'd, we'd made. Um, and we got some great feedback from them also in terms of some of the conceptual things and, and made some adjustments here and there. So really did appreciate it. Um, it was a, a full court press, like getting as much information as we could um, and pulling it together. Uh, and as you might imagine, a lot of this information is sitting in places on, on websites where people don't usually go, right? The about us uh, pages or, or buried in, in financial legal disclosures and things like that. So uh, one of the hopes is that we're really surfacing useful information that may not be easy to find. Um, for those of you, that hopefully you've had a chance to look at the application, look at our catalog. Um, we're going to do that always daunting live demo. I'm just going to go through um, where what we have and, and kind of orient you to um, the catalog. So we this is the index page where things where where it all begins, uh, if you will. We we list the projects um, or the services rather that we um, are including in this, and then we um, notes on data sources FAQs which we recently updated with some um, initial questions that we got, uh, which we appreciate the feedback. And we'll continue to update that with the kind of high level kind of answering questions and then be turning that into more formal technical documentation to a company um, to, to a company quiz in the near future and our acknowledgements. I want to take a, just a really quick moment to address one of the questions that came up about why these 10. Um, really, so we've we started this project back in the summer. Um, started you know going through all the, the sources that the K outlined and, and we're really starting to kind of wrap our head around the landscape and what's out there and started to apply a framework of understanding about these different services, um, knowing we wanted to focus on nonprofit services and um, ones that were ubiquitous. So we, we started with this kind of criteria and selected these 10. Um, as a prototype, we never intended this to be exhaustive. There's nothing, you know, we're we've been made very clear, you know, we were going with this criteria, we were applying it in this situation. These are the projects that we're looking at. Um, but we know there's a lot of others that are just as worthy, if not more so, of inclusion. But we wanted to be um, mindful of capturing the breadth of, of services that are available, different types of services, and trying to find ones that are representative, and also break out of the North American European frame to try and, and, and include services that weren't located in those areas, in those regions. Um, and also, you know, services that, that may be smaller and served a more niche, but that created some interesting kind of conditions that we need to be aware of as we're developing our methods and approaches um, to this challenge. So that's why you know, these 10, you've know, been a lot of concern on why these 10, 
it, some of it was arbitrary, but it was guided by this, this desire to be representative and also and break out of these, these usual formats to approve approaches and, and knowing we were gonna come back and scale and, and improve this as we go. Um, so with that, I just wanna dive and just kind of into one of these uh, entries here. So we'll start with Open Journal Systems from Public Knowledge Project, a, a project based um, mostly in Canada um, with associations at Stanford University. So we have um, four tabs here, which you'll notice the overview, organization, finances, and delivery. Uh, so these are basically four facets of um, the, the service that we wanna try and capture with this. And I'll just pause for a second to say, virtually almost all of the information in here is descriptive, meaning we're just kind of gathering, gathering the crumbs from around the internet and other places and putting them together. Um, but on the overview page, um, what we try and do is be a little bit more evaluative. And we're trying to apply a framework um, borrowed from COPEM um, in this, the, the two dimensions of, of transformative influence and community engagement. So while the service summary is pretty much drawn from the providers themselves, like how they describe their service, um, this transformative influence and community engagement piece is something where we um, are trying to make some uh, evaluative judgments about the service and where they're at and how they're providing this, the, the service into the space um, with links to references. You know, when we talk about, you know, do they have an open code registry repository, for example, um, a link to that repository, which we see in SCOMCAD and some of the other resources. We're trying to bring it together and, and, and say, you know, these are important things. Um, when one is, is trying to be open, these are particular things that are important for openness uh, to be present. So. Uh, we do surface that information in here. Um, same with community engagement. We do describe, you know, these dimensions, organizational commitment, community governance, user contribution pathways with descriptive text. Why are we making this judgment and the links to the supporting documents for it? Um, we, we do recognize that this is not as descriptive as it could be and, and clear. And we're working on that as part of our documentation um, just to, to surface this uh, more and again, to contribute to the conversation about these, this criteria is appropriate, is it not? Um, it's an evolving thing, it's, we're still working on it. We started with nine, we're to eight, we might end up with 10, who knows? So it's, it is a work in progress, but it's a starting point as a prototype for, for conversation. So, um, so we have the overview, the organization tab here takes us into some, again, the details of the organization. So there's some awareness of the background, the history, the personalities involved. Uh, I am a newcomer to this space, to the open science space. And so uh, this kind of history background is very important for me so that I understand more of the context um, for what the way things are, the way things have been, um, and which is, is extremely important for, for me, for people like me, I think, who are outside the space coming into it um, to get oriented quickly to some of the key features. And we'd have a little history blur about you know, the organization and, and where it's come from. And then we, talk, again, in this descriptive frame is talking about the organizational structure. So we have a high level categorization of the model. Is it uh, a standalone nonprofit? Is it institutionally housed, fiscally sponsored? Um, without, we're not trying to make an, a, 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 you know, a value-based judgment. We're not trying to say one's better than the other, uh, but each of those come with certain opportunities and challenges and things to be aware of when understanding the service and how it's provided. Um, and what, what does that mean to have an institution backing it or not backing it in terms of control and management and governance and financial support and those kinds of things. Um, we surface also the names and affiliations of the leadership, how an organization is governed, um, board members, board member structure, things like that, that um, just again, having an awareness of who are the personalities involved, how is this structured, um, what's the, how is this work, uh, we look at advisory steering committee versus a board of directors, the differentiator being the, the legal obligation, the fiduciary responsibility of a legally constituted board of directors, vice a, a less formal steering committee. And again, we, we address that in our FAQ and are happy to talk more about that if there's some questions about that. Uh, but we are trying to surface again, more of this, like how the organization works, not just what they do. Um, finances, uh, we try and pull in whatever financial information we can find. when. And we have it, we'll, we'll have some kind of source notation about it, where it came from um, for you know, documentation purpose so we know where it's at. Um, top granting organizations, uh, this is a list of just those organizations. We don't, given the, uh, the challenge of finding the funding and, and accurately accounting for, this went to 
this service vice another service that the same provider may be, be um, providing. We just opted for just listing who the funders are um, and the number of members, sponsors, people involved. The self-ranking importance measures relate back to the survey that I mentioned, that pre-interview survey, where the, um, the service providers themselves are making the, the estimates based on their understanding, their perspective on the service. How important are these different funding sources? So in this case for um, open journal systems, knowing program service revenue, meaning fees, things that they get from their, their members is very important as is government funding. So they get a lot of government funding from apparently from the Canadian government. Uh, this is very important, but they also, the, the individual donors as well are important to their, to, to their model, less so the corporate giving and investment income that they may have. So yes, they're very highly subjective, but you know, they're the best thing we have in understanding kind of the landscape from their point of view um, on these different funding sources. As far as the cost percentages, one of the areas we're very interested in exploring is understanding, surfacing the, the hidden or unknown or just um, less well-known perhaps uh, maintenance costs, um, operational costs of these services. Uh, free, op free and open source isn't free <laughs> financially. There are costs involved and, and accounting for those costs is really important in making, helping these projects be more sustainable. So we surface that information in here. Um, in the finances tab, the delivery tab is where we get into understanding a little bit more of the technology involved. Uh, OJS is a little bit different and it doesn't have a really a, it, it, it's a little bit different in terms of this orientation. So there's not much of this populated in here, um, but we do have in here the self-ranking importance measures. So understanding for staffing purposes, uh, the relative importance of each of these to their uh, operations and how they deliver their service and how involved users are in the development and the delivery of the, of, of what they do. So and we include that information in here. Um, so that is pretty much the overview of, of COIS as it exists today. Uh, I want to just um, offer some grateful acknowledgements uh, and we'll, with this, uh, really the project leaders, uh, those involved in the service, um, you know, the, the time they gave us was in, in, invaluable and we know this is not, <laughs> they've got other things to do than talk to us. And we really appreciate them taking the time to talk to us. Uh, we like to believe this is a value add in this space and worth their time. And we try to make this their worth, worth their while as, as much as we can. So grateful for them and, and their involvement in this. This project is better because of that. Um, also, the institutional leaders, funders, and experts in nonprofit effectiveness and assessment writ large. So for those of you who aren't aware, there, there is a, a large um, body of, of research and, and researchers who really focus on nonprofit management. Um, and we're really excited to tap into that experience, that knowledge of how nonprofits um, can be looked at, um, thought about, and improved, strengthened, uh, made more resilient, and bringing that knowledge into this space more. So we really appreciate their involvement with us. Uh, concurrent with the interviews that we ran with the projects and service providers, uh, we also ran a funders um, focus group, and that also gave us some really great insight into this as well. So really appreciate their, um, their time and, and expertise that they, they gave to us in the course of this project. And the, the design support from Alison McCartney, our designer, is uh, just invaluable. If Kay and I were responsible for making this, it would work. It would look nice. It just won't look as pretty as it does now. So we're immensely grateful to her and all of her hard work on, on the application. So um, with that, I just really want to quickly comment on some of the future work. I'm going to hand it back here to Kay in a moment. But um, from a technical, conceptual side, we're, we're still very much, we have a few little bugs to, to kind of iron out in the application. Uh, we have a lot of documentation to get down as far as, um, again, the, the how we did what we did as far as the collection of the data. We're, we're working through blog posts on that to cover that piece and want to working on some knowledge management to kind of get that into a, a more formal you know, archive of record for that, uh, but also some of these conceptual frameworks that we've used, adapted, reused, repurposed for this, uh, explaining those with more clarity, I think is really important to continue the conversation and particular where we're drawing the lines on certain things. So um, I, for example, we talk about transformative influence when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, having a, a clear understanding of what does that mean that's in line with our our values, right? It's in some, it, we can talk about whether it's sufficient just to say 
yes, we're inclusive. Yes, we're, we're going to have a safe environment versus it, there's a contrast between that and someone who's actually going out proactively to engage with underrepresented communities uh, to include them and, and, and engage with them as part of their their service. So uh, and we want to make really highlight that as, as part of this work. So so more documentation to do. And, and this the forum actually is really important for us uh, to understand what documentation the community needs to really engage with this work. So thank you for all of you for joining us this evening and or morning, afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are. Uh, providing your impact, you're helping us make this documentation better. Thanks, Richard. Um, and speaking just quickly, because I want to make sure we've got some time for questions and answers. And um, I would say, you know, I see some people that are populating some questions in the shared document. Please feel free to keep adding those, and we'll we'll go through uh, as many of those as we can um, in the next section. One of the biggest questions that we've received is, "What's our plan for scaling this, um, and and where does it go from here?" Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, all of those different lists of infrastructure services, um, one of the initial bits of work that we had, that uh, one of our colleagues, Asura, who's not here with us um, on this call, um, did was to pull as much of that together. And so we have, um, while we recognize that there are still gaps in terms of the representation among the um, resources that we've pulled together and areas that we want to continue to grow, um, we have a, an exhaustive uh, or at least exhaustive as a start. Um, it seems exhaustive in terms of, you know, the number of, of products we have there. Um, list of additional projects and services that um, as we go into these next few weeks as a team, thinking about the strategy for how we want to incrementally start um, growing this, um, we will be looking at expanding the representation here. Um, we will be sharing that out as we, um, you know, kind of make those make those decisions, but that is top of mind on our end. Um, the other element outside of the sort of breadth of representation in the catalog is also about depth. Um, and this is where the data sources that I know Richard gave us a really nice walkthrough. We've got some additional blog posts that I'll add um, to the chat that go into a little bit more detail about some of the information that we pulled into this. And we recognize that there are always additional things that we are learning through this and um, sources of information that are being surfaced. For example, in the call earlier today uh, about different forms of legal documentation and conditions that might we might want to keep an eye out for based on where a project might be registered outside of areas that we are more familiar with. Um, and so, you know, if there's any ideas that you may have there, please let us know. Um, again, you know, we don't expect to have all the answers as our core team. Um, this is why we rely on these sorts of community feedback sessions and, and learning with you so that we can better serve um, these communities as well. Richard, is there anything else about the data sources um, and the information that's presented that you'd like to add? I guess I would just say, I mean, it's it's tempting to confine this just to the US-based nonprofits um, who have reporting requirements to the US IRS, uh, but we were intentionally going outside of the US, as I mentioned. And for that purpose, we're really trying to explore um, what sorts of information exists. Like, I'm, I'm not familiar with the Australian taxing authority around nonprofits. I intend to become more aware of it. I'm becoming very familiar with Canadians and how you have to request to get a CD sent to you, which seems weird, but whatever. Um, so we were exploring these nuances and, and trying to understand this. And um, so it's, we, I definitely want to be emphasized that we're, we're not just, we, we don't want to replicate that kind of, you know, you North American centric or even North American and European centric kind of lens with this financial information. Um, and we, Obviously, we would love to see more of like 360 givings, their, their kind of record of uh, grants and information available and, and encourage more and more disclosure around this. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to make the best of what we've got at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is, um, as, as Richard had noted, there were a number of you know, um, decisions that we made just to be able to get this prototype out for initial feedback um, and elements that we had hoped that we were going to be able to include additional research questions, of course, that kind of spun up as we got into this investigation. Um, one of the other really fascinating elements, as Richard had mentioned, in terms of data sources that were 
we had some questions about or did not seem immediately accessible. Um, it has been a great opportunity for us to start speaking to those who might be able to provide us with additional insight. Um, so again, if there are individuals or places that you think we should be um, you know, building out more of a relationship with um, or more of a dialogue with, please also let us know because that's, that's what we're here for. Okay, with that, thank you for Richard for running the slide. Um, and I think from there, we'll, we'll start going into some of the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna start with some of the questions that are in the, in the document. Please feel free to add those. And then also given the size of this group, um, we can let people kind of vocalize some questions from there if that sounds good. Um, one of the first questions, I'm going to allocate this one to you, Richard, um, but just to vocalize this, um, it'd be interesting to be able to easily see if people are involved in multiple organizations. Is there a plan to do that? Uh, this is a thing. I don't think that's a shock to anyone in this room. <laughs> it is a thing. Uh, we are looking at that. Um, the, th there, it's, the name resolution piece is not an insignificant challenge around this, and we've talked about that. Um, it's, you know, when you talk about personnel involved, it's because many of the leadership and staff usually will come from the science space and so they may have an ORCID or some other kind of unique identifier, but for board members, it's a little bit more problematic. And um, I mentioned the, the nonprofit kind of the research space around that. And there is an idea of really looking at the overlap, one board with another, the personalities involved and what Kind of dynamics that may create intentionally unintentionally you know latent and manifest effects um so this is important it is interesting to us to look at as um as a kind of just an understanding about diversity or maybe lack thereof around these kind of pieces of the organization um it is on our road where we're thinking about it it's just not quite clear we're not necessarily the place being able to implement it quite yet but very interesting topic and we're in touch with people who are doing this like i said in the larger space and we're anticipating their um, the release of their information, which is going to help enable our work as well. Yeah, and I would just I would just add to this as well that the um, the phrase that's used in looking at the broader sort of nonprofit effectiveness and management space. Um, also, there's a nonprofit data open data cooperative the, of individuals that are doing this work, which are just our source of people um, is uh, referred to as board interlock. And I know that there's been a lot of conversation in the work that we've done for IOI um, since I joined about how the power dynamics um, are playing into this. And so this is something that I think as we continue to move into the space and consult with experts about how we can best analyze and surface this information, um, especially as it ties to funding decisions or possible fragility in the ecosystem, um, you know, thinking about where we can uh, share out some additional analysis about that. It's a great question. Um, the next question is, how will we maintain the integrity and the accuracy of the data we include? Is there a strategy around this? Richard. <laughs> uh, yes, so there, well, there's two aspects to that, right? Um, the data in of itself is not, necessarily accurate. We've surfaced a lot of inaccuracies with the data and we've um, uh, released some blog posts describing some of those kind of for instances in the data that we've seen. Um, so there's a, we, we can only be as accurate as we can be given the, given the data that we have. So um, we do have a plan to review the data, to be able to go back and look at it. What we're trying to work out now is a, a, a more sustainable approach to this. So I, I liken this to uh, we talk about producing goods, right? This is very much the artisanal handcrafted, you know, hammer and chisel trying to make something that um, really can and should be have, have more kind of mechanization to it, more standardization to make it easier. So with that will become ways to quality, quality assurance and quality control on the data that we have and, and more rapid validation to pick up easy mistakes that we may introduce, but also to clarify things where we see, for example, you know, websites that are inaccurate, whether it's the funder date site or the provider site, uh, we've found errors in IRS forms, reporting forms, like just glaring obvious, they, they missed something. So, um, and surfacing those. So 
we do we, uh, we put a lot of work into accuracy i just we want to make it we want to automate it and make it more um manageable going forward knowing that short of like having them register every grant with us or you know doing and also to the challenge right of we're very good about unique identifiers for research outputs dois things like that for it but we're not for the the, the funding that supports that the services so you know surfacing that and hopefully finding ways where we can better track this will help immeasurably this this question about accuracy and, and maintaining it integrity going forward so we can only do our best surface a lot of the people review what we do give us feedback um and hopefully encourage those who are producing this to be more accurate with what they provide yeah and just a quick note on that too um so when we were pulling together this information and doing so sort of in conversation with the project leaders knowing that there was a significant amount that we were pulling together and uh, richard especially was doing research to pull together from other publicly available data sources that we've documented um, to help augment in some cases we were surfacing numbers to projects that they had not had access to in the past um, even projects i will say because i know this is you know again a, a learning space even Project Jupiter that has extremely distributed governance and also distributed funding structures of information that we had that then sparked a broader conversation and dialogue with them, right? Um, and so one of the other elements of that as we were preparing for this information to be made public, we did um, share and have an opportunity for the project leaders who engage in this um, work with us um, to provide comment. And so, you know, I know we have had for IOI community review for strategic plan for future open scholarship deliverables, etc. Um, we had a, a sort of community review for those project leads to also um, engage them in that process before this went to production. Um, but one of the um, pieces of, uh, I think, one of the most interesting um, points of that discussion that that sparked was um, and you can see this in our FAQ because there's a couple of tables that we've included um, getting back to Richard's point about being an evidence-based organization of having a really active dialogue of like yes it's you are publishing board minutes but it's not in a publicly accessible link that's something that is only known if you are on the board we're happy to update it when that's when that's live and you know I think we do need to as a broader broader ecosystem recognize that that's that's not necessarily criticize. I mean, there are elements that we are still actively building out for IOI as an organization um, and not taking that as something, you know, negative or that we're trying to shame an organization, but as an opportunity to help, you know, continuously improve. Um, and so we do, um, you can read more about that on our FAQ, but um, the, the validation and the verification that even for like every single individual grant we went through, and especially Richard went through just naming you in this, um, was was extensive, which is also why focusing on those 10 projects was really important to make sure that we could get as much accuracy as possible at the, at the outset. Yeah. Um, just to go off of that and also flag that um, my son, who's a, a, a <laughs> notorious Zoom bomber, may be making an appearance soon. Um, <laughs> but to also, but he's really cute, so it's worth it. Um, to, to build on that too, right? So part of this is, I don't think we should be asking the service providers to think about some of these larger things about governance and values and things like that like they they have other things to be doing and it, it's quite a challenge to really look across the landscape and know what other people are doing so we see this as a service to help engage with them and empower them and help them think about things they may not have so very much in this framework of nudges or just hey by the ways and things like that are i think the way to a build community build trust but then help build a more resilient community uh, together, cooperate more and collaborate more around this. So we're happy to be a mechanism of collaboration and a check, like I said, for a broken link or some resources that mm -hmm. things have shifted and just not aware of. So it's yeah. definitely a, a win from this, I feel. Yeah. in uh, minimizing that burden, again, it's, a, it's a, a fine sort of balance, but ensuring that these projects can continue to focus on what they need to do, which is providing a core service to the broader community. Um, it's a great question. Um, the next question here is, could the catalog be opened up to IOI affiliated users so entries could be amended or updated like a wiki? I'm going to hand that back to Richard. I almost want to give it to Anne. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Yes, I, the idea was just to kind of get the data in there. We definitely, you know, our approach with, with all of these is to, we want to bias towards using the open tools and the open formats and the open mechanisms that are there, but also knowing there's an overhead to kind of put all those pieces together. So we've kind of just got something out there, but with the intention of going back and examining, okay, how can we make this better, more aligned with what we want to do? Is this platform the right way of doing it? Um, I mentioned Anne because she is a, um, a knowledgeable Wikimedian, Wikipedia, Wikidata in, I guess. Is that her? I, you know. So we, we definitely have, have, have want that expertise of how you leverage a community resource like Wikidata uh, in this. And uh, Anne's done some research into Wikidata for us and how we might leverage that. Um, so yes, we definitely think it can be. We we're still figuring out how that would work in a manageable way so we can maintain the integrity and accuracy of the data, but be more community involved, have community involvement in this and make this a, a community space where people come to to contribute information. Um, that helps empower everyone, helps make things easier for us <laughs> to kind of maintain this, um, but overall just reflects our values and, and how we wanna work uh, in this space. Yeah, and it's a it's a great point too. I also, Jenny, I see your question in the chat too as well. Um, the other element that I would flag on that, so um, we'll be sharing more about that. Anne um, joined us. She was one of our inaugural research fellows who, you know, focused on doing a prototype. Not to embarrass you, Anne, um, focused on an initial prototype to look at how information about some of these service providers could be represented in Wikidata. And so we are kind of testing the waters to see as we look at making this information more publicly available and contributable, what sort of mechanisms and places is that best suited for? Also the component on our end, um, and I think this is um, a, a key sort of difference with some of the more sort of self-certification mechanisms like for example, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, which we draw a lot of inspiration from, you know, on our end, um, what does the accountability mechanism look like? And so that we can ensure that it is um, trusted, verified information, and that there's also active maintenance for that. And I know that the POSI community is going to be meeting in terms of those adopters to talk about some of the challenges and learning so far. Um, I think that they're aiming for that meeting to happen in March. But I think that that's also a consideration on our side too, of you know what does it look like to ensure that each piece of this information is being checked um, and reviewed. The last thing I'll note is um, we again, as I mentioned, we are going into some strategy planning for the future of this, and we'll be sharing out those plans. So there's some active questions, and this is why this information is really useful to surface now. Um, we are uh, we have told providers that if something changes and they surface that to us, we are happy to push those changes. Um, additionally, we have a community oversight council of practitioners that we are um, next month going to be working with to help better spec out um, a process for them to be more actively involved in uh, accountability and oversight for elements of our work, including the catalog. Um, the last thing too, is that we are committing to at least annually, and that for right now, we're going to say annually, um, you know, reviewing these pages. Um, that is separate from when there are, for example, like when 990 data is published and is available for us to update into our um, back database, our backend database, um, backend and database, it's late in our time, you get what I mean, um, that we will be, uh, again, also making sure that that is kind of part of our sort of uh, maintenance strategy for this resource as well. I see Nate is putting identifier recommendations in the chat. Thank you, Nate. Um, the other um, suggestion here from Ginny, which I'm just gonna I'm gonna copy over into our notes doc about um, having a date stamp on each record. Um, that actually was an idea that was surfaced by another community member when we released this on Friday um, so that we know when it was last updated and last verified. Um, and so we have filed uh, that as an issue um, for us to kind of take on as a team and also for the next phase of work um, that we're gonna propose with our designer. Cause um, again, we had to make some, um, we had to make some some cuts. So things like, for example, a means of filtering or searching among catalog pages, um, additional templates, etc. Um, those are things that we're kind of putting on our wish list to approach um, now that we've gotten this initial launch underway. 
So we're just about 10, 10 minutes from the top of the hour. Are there any, oh, I just pasted in the link to this document. Um, are there any additional questions that folks may have? And I'd say given the size here, please feel free to unmute if you'd like to vocalize those and we'll make sure those are captured in our notes. I guess if there's no questions, can I ask, does anyone have any feedback, just general thoughts, mm -hmm. impressions, just, you know, doesn't have to be form, in the form of a question. It can be a statement, <laughs> just thoughts for us. I think it looks great. I think it's good. T terrible time sink. I can see myself pouring through this endlessly. <laughs> so great to see it come to fruition. Great work. And, and it looks beautiful as well, you know, so that, that, that really helps a lot. I thought the visualizations are very striking. So, yeah. I mean, for example, you know, stuff like the DOI thing is was, was the one I was particularly interested in and uh, comparing that with some of the others. So, yeah, great work. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'll also just note, because I know, um, oh, sorry, Amanda, I saw that you came off, came off video. Go ahead. Um, yes, I, I would just um, agree with what Ginny is saying, that it's amazing. Um, here at Curtin, we were actually doing a project to compare open infrastructure. So we were comparing Zenodo and DSpace, and it was like, oh, if we had this. <laughs> well, Amanda, if you... It, please feel free um we can follow up with you as well if we can we can help it might be too late in that process but we would love to learn from your experience too on that side yeah and the other thing that i was just going to quickly note is um i will say you know for example with the doi foundation that you mentioned jenny there wasn't a ton of information that was on the website we had a lot of questions um and especially looking at dependencies and you know, not only in terms of board representation, but also in terms of what that relationship looks like, where money gets passed through, et cetera. Um, it's a great example of, of a place where there wasn't a lot of information. To be honest, we weren't sure really what we were gonna get out of it, but the managing agent involved um, was extremely forthcoming and generous with um, his, his time. And that's, I think, something that is really useful as we go into some of these other elements as well, because there's a lot of usual suspects, but also a number of other projects that having that dialogue is really, um, can, be, can be really transformative and helpful in moving this work forward. Challenging your own assumptions, best we can. Any other comments, questions, feedback? I'm, I'm comfortable with long waits. Okay, um, I know it is early um, for you all. <laughs> Not in a place I can talk. Thank you, Nate, for putting that into the chat. Um, and again, you know, I know we had these um, two sessions today. We will be sharing out, um, you know, our learnings actively on this. Um, please feel free to continue to um, share feedback with us as well. But with that, I'll hand it over to Anne to wrap us up. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, again, uh, just to reiterate what Caitlin just said, the, the notes and the slides and the recording will be available soon. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, please do reach out and keep in touch. Thank you again for attending. <laughs>